Before I start this video, I would like to mention my new Discord channel. You can join it at the link or using the QR code available. So let's get into the video. <clears throat> We're going to start with the South Central Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania <clears throat> Regional Goods Movement Study. Final report prepared for Harrisburg Area Transport Study. That would be HATS. South Central Pennsylvania Regional Goods Movement Steering Committee, Cambridge Systematics Incorporated, or prepared by, with Global Insight, PB, Faradine, Astros, Wider Incorporated, November 2006. Uh, and those, of course, are your juridic entities, where the individuals involved in those juridic entities uh, won't be mentioned, probably, because uh, it's all about... Uh, domination and and the individuals are never recognized in the juridical empire that we live under right now so here we get a map letting you know that the major transportation facilities in South Central Pennsylvania study area uh, the region is involving multiple counties in Pennsylvania as well as cities. Here it states, why is freight planning important? The Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, ISTEA of 1991, emphasized the importance of considering freight in the transportation planning process. Since that time, the incorporation of freight issues has become more and more prevalent when considering policy planning and programming activities at State Departments of Transportation, Department of Transportation, DOT, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, MPO, Rural Planning Organizations, RPO, and counties. Some of the key reasons that freight matters in national planning and in South Central Pennsylvania in particular include blah, blah, blah. We can find this under the Tri-Regional Planning Commission out of Peoria, Illinois. Here we can look at some of the members listed in which we have uh, no... Um, <clears throat> No positions particularly uh, listed on the roll call for the minutes, just names and places. That should be enough. However, when we look at the Tri County Regional Planning Commission Board and Committee membership, we have Leon Rica, Bartonville Village of, and there's a Karen Dvorsky, which is listed as IDOT. Let's go ahead and look at some of these names. Here we have Don White of Chillicothe. And he's a public works government type uh, architect, apparently. Then we have Mary Burris, who was the Tazewell County Treasurer and is mayor of the city of Pekin, Illinois. That's something you'll notice with the rest of the people on that council. A lot of them are mayors or involved in some other department or whatever. So it all looks on the up and up. At least as far as corrupt corporate so-called governments can be. So Illinois has between it and Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Ohio which is an important element to note. So now we're going to look at the Columbus Region Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, or SEDS, C-E-D-S, from October 14, 2021, part of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, or M-O-R-P-C. Hard to say is MORP. Pretty weird. Now, the... Columbus reintroduction. The Columbus region, consisting of 11 counties of Delaware, Fairfield, Franklin, Knox, Licking, Logan, Madison, Marion, Morrow, Pickaway, and Union, is a metropolitan area located in the central Ohio. That is a very confusing paragraph because that whole region is not metropolitan. The only metropolitan area is Columbus, but they have essentially declared territory over this so-called Columbus region, basically meaning that all of the counties are meaningless because they're all incorporated within this region of this particular group. 
Anyway, the city of Columbus, centrally located in the region, is the state capital and largest city of Ohio and the 14th largest city in the U.S. The regional economy is diverse and growing as a center for innovation. Blah, blah, blah. Now, when we look at the list of the people on that said strategy committee for the so-called Columbus region, we have Corey Alton, Vice President, Commercial Loans, Park National Bank. The Vice President of this committee group that determines pretty much everything under the sun as far as what happens in that region is the is a, a vice president of a bank. That's nice. Michael Augenstein, director of Workforce Solutions, Marion Technical College. Mark Barbosh, director of Ohio Economic Development Institute, Ohio Economic Development, blah, blah, blah. You have a Scott Cubley, senior brokerage advisor with Equity. You have the have Christian Easter Kristen Easter Day, Director of Communications and Public Affairs at Columbus Regional Airport Authority. And then you also have uh, many other corporate people that are determining the governmental so-called structure of planning for things like the highway system, uh, the air quality and uh, basically everything that has to do with the planning and management of, of land and property and whatnot. Such as with Brian Huprick, Chief Financial Officer of the Ariel Corporation. And then you also have Frank Hickman, Founder of Whetstone Business Consulting. You have Jeff Polevoski, Vice President of Public Policy, Columbus Partnership. And you also have Pickaway Progress Partnership, Executive Director Ryan Scribner, Associate Director of Business Solutions Chance Shannon at Workforce Development Board of Central Ohio. You have Rick Sazabrak, Director of Economic Workforce Development, Fairfield County, and just a bunch of other ones. So the Park National Bank, which as we noticed that first name, he was the Vice President of this institution. Park National Bank operates with 83 branches in 60 different cities and towns in the state of Ohio. The bank also has nine more offices in three states. Locations with Park National Bank offices are shown on the map below. Blah, blah, blah. So let's look at that map. So it's no accident that this so-called Columbus region, which incorporates all of these counties around into one large uh, mass uh, centralized administrative area, well, it's no surprise that when the vice president of this Park National Bank that sits there um, would clearly have, make decisions at the benefit of expansion of that particular banking structure, right? So it's no accident that he sits on that uh, board, committee, whatever, and there's so much of a heavy Park National Bank presence in Ohio. Now we're going to look at the Ohio MPO Administration Manual, last updated January 2019. 10. MPO Planning Funds Federal Metropolitan Planning Funds are appropriated annually by Congress and distributed to the states by federal formula. These include FHWA, PL funds, and FTA Section 5303 funds. ODOT that allocates the funds to the individual MPOs for the planning work detailed in their work programs. The allocation of funds is based on a formula agreed to by the MPOs, ODOT, FHWA, and FTA. Statutes and regulations of uh, statutes and regulations 10.1. The statutes and regulations involving the distribution and reimbursement of MPO planning funds are Title 23, United States Code establishes United States transportation laws governing the federal aid highway system. Section 134 requires the designation of a metropolitan planning organization for each urbanized area of 50,000 population or more and that the metropolitan area have a continuing comprehensive and cooperative transportation planning process. Notice that it says metropolitan area, not declared region over multiple counties. Title II's Code of Federal Regulations, CFR, implements the provisions of federal law established relating to the administration of federal grants and agreements. Part 200, Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards 
prescribes the OBM policies and procedures for the administration of federal grants and agreements, blah, blah, blah. Title 23 Code of Federal Regulation implements the provisions of federal law established under 23 USC related to the administration of federal aid for highways. Planning, uh, Part 420, Planning and Research Program Administration prescribes the FHWA policies and procedures for the administration of activities undertaken by states and MPOs with FHWA planning and research funds. FHWA, of course, stands for the Federal Highway, uh, Highway, Federal Highway, something administration. I don't remember what the W stands for. Part 450, Planning Assistance and Standards, establishes the procedures for implementing the provisions of 23 U.S.C. 134, including development of plans and programs. We must consider all transportation modes and support metropolitan community and development and social goals. Notice that word there, right? Social goals and metropolitan community development. Interesting terms. Title 49, United States Code, creates the U.S. Department of Transportation, establishes its powers and duties, along with the responsibilities of the Federal Highway, uh, whatever, Administration, and FTA. Section 104, Federal Highway Administration, describes the powers and duties vested in FHWA and by 23 U.S.C. Section 107, Federal Transit Administration, describes the powers and duties prescribed to FTA by the United States Secretary of Transportation. Isn't that interesting that we have a transit and highway administration? Metropolitan planning, or section 5303, metropolitan planning stipulates that the 3C transportation planning process required by 23 OC 134 be conducted in coordination with mass transportation operators to ensure that transportation plans and programs provide for the consideration of all modes of transportation, particularly mass transit, walking, and bicycling. Title 49, Code of Federal Aid Regulations, establishes and codifies the federal rules, regulations, requirements, and provisions of Title 49 U.S.C., including the Federal Transportation Fund and funding programs administered by FHWA and FTA. And nowhere here, as always, are the articles of the U.S. Constitution cited, because these people are all corporate imperial uh, occupants acting on behalf of foreign stakeholders or investors. Part 613, Planning Assistance and Standards, establishes parallel metropolitan and statewide transportation planning and programming standards for FTA that mirror those established for FHWA. 23 CFR Part 450 requires that the regulations in 23 CFR 450 be allowed, followed in the administration of FTA transportation planning and program funds. Title 1, Chapter 126, Ohio Revised Code, Office of Budget and Management, 126.07. Certification of balance statements in all statement in all contracts requires a certification by the Ohio Office of Budget and Management that sufficient funds have been appropriated by the Ohio General Assembly to ODOT for the purposes of the MPO slash ODOT agreements. General definitions for Chapter 10 can be found in the above statutes and regulations. 10.2 Consolidated Planning Grant. For the purpose of the MPO work programs, the FHWPL funds, the FTA Section 5303 funds are combined to form the Consolidated Planning Grant CPG funds. The funding is allocated to MPOs it is allocated as CPG funds rather than two separate pots of money. Prior to the beginning of the fiscal year, ODOT requests that the FTA, blah, blah, blah. The rest of this is uh, not exactly necessary for the purpose of this video. Now we look at the work program subcategories where it says MPO work programs should be broken up into subcategory. The subcategory options and the resulting category subcategory number are as follows. Here we notice we have environmental protection, 673. There's also 667 for rideshare activities. I'm sure many know what that means. 630, participation in statewide planning. And there's 625 under services. And then there's 615, continuing surveillance and procedural development. Obviously, most of these would be important to look into, but you also have 605 continuing planning dash surveillance. That's interesting. There's two sections there, both stipulating surveillance. Now we look at the 685 Indiana exclusive, 686 Kentucky exclusive, 687 Michigan exclusive, 688 Pennsylvania exclusive, 689 West Virginia exclusive. So Ohio is a central hub, shall we say. It's sort of designed like a wheel, despite being constantly referred to as the heart of the nation. 
and access to most of these other states runs through Ohio. So naturally, they would have linkages between the other corrupt operators in those states. 10.7 reimbursement. ODOT will reimburse the MPO with federal and state funds for eligible costs incurred subject to the terms and conditions of the effective biannual, biennial agreement and the amounts and percentages reflected in the overall annual work program or work program budget tables covered by the agreement. And here it's got all of their little excessive specifications, most of which, of course, have to do with the money laundering scheme that is being in place today. Now, it should be noticed here, 10.9, carryover funding. At the end of each fiscal year, an MPO may have balance of unspent CPG funds. These funds are eligible to be carried forward into the next fiscal year under the following conditions. An updated current year work program budget submitted to ODOT central office. That includes carryover funding. Carryover funding should be shown separate from the current fiscal year CPG funds. So, that is another way to hide money, more money laundering um, methods is in the carryover funding section. Some other interesting categories, we have 11.5 potential loan options and 11.6 toll credits. In order to reduce the amount of carryover funds each year, MPOs are encouraged to seek out loans rather than relying on a waiver. And remember, one of the major players on that committee was the vice president or is of Park National Bank. Some potential loan options along with the person to contact to initiate the loan are another MPO slash large city, ODOT central office liaison, ODOT district, and blah, blah, blah. Full credits. Full credits are credits that states earn from non-federal capital expenditures that public or private agency, agencies such as the Ohio Turnpike make to build, improve, or maintain highways, bridges, or tunnels that serve public purpose of interstate commerce. That's, of course, the juridic public, mind you. Section 120J of the Title 23 permits the use of toll credits to fulfill some or all of the federal matching fund requirements normally associated with financing of eligible Title 23 and Title 49 service transportation capital operating or planning projects. The application of TC increases the federal share of a product, thereby reducing required non-federal match requirements. It is important to note that TCs are not cash or additional funding, but instead are credits that can be applied to surface transportation federal aid projects. Utilizing TCs increases the percentage and amount of federal funding that is used to finance an eligible project. More money laundering. The MPO and large city program will be allocated about $47 million in TC annually for SFYs, blah, blah, blah. Looking at a table of MPOs and available tax or toll credits, ha, 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 ha. Um, we can look at some interesting places, such as Lancaster, Ohio, in which there are, in fact, no toll roads, yet they are allocated toll credits. Has to be interesting. Here it says it's important to note the following conditions related to use of TC. TC can be applied only to active projects, no retroactive TC application. TC usage must be recorded in Ellis and included in project federal authorization requests. TC cannot be applied to SIB loans or emergency projects. TC will not be advanced from a future year and cannot be swapped between programs, between MPO programs and other programs such as CEAO. TC can be carried forward until the end of 2020, at which point it elapses. MPOs in large cities will be responsible for developing their own projects policies, procedures for applying TC to MPO and large city program projects. So we see that it states that, as an important note, is that it can't be applied to SIB loans or emergency projects. That doesn't mean that they can't use TCs, which aren't, which aren't cash, of course, as perhaps collateral for some other sort of loan, which then, of course, naturally does not actually go onto the quote unquote books. And so you have an understanding of just another element, I suppose, because there are many, of the laundry, money laundering system that runs this corporate state empire that we live under today. The Interstate 76 goes from Ohio to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. 
It is a one of the two direct routes through Pennsylvania from the East Coast to Ohio, and then of course from Ohio to other parts. As with all of those surrounding states mentioned, West Virginia, um, <clears throat> Illinois, uh, Idaho, well not Idaho, uh, Indiana, yep, uh, Michigan, etc. <clears throat> And naturally, along this route, there are numerous toll roads. June 29, 2021, the Pennsylvania 2023 Transportation Program Financial Guidance. Here we should look at Turnpike Funding. Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission receives funding from a variety of sources, including toll revenues, state funding earmarked in Act 26 of 1991, Act 3 of 1997, and Act 28 or 89 of 2013, and special federal funding earmarked by Congress. These funds are not reflected in this financial guidance. The authority for the programming of projects using these funding sources rests with the PTC. PTC does implement projects that qualify for regular federal funds, but if the PTC desires to pursue regular federal funding, projects will be presented for consideration with other state and local projects within the appropriate planning region. However, all regionally significant turnpike projects, regardless of the funding source, should be included our regional TIPs as required by statewide planning regulations. So there's more funding that would be quote unquote off the books, shall we say, managed by someone else or maneuvered through someone else, more like. The agreement between the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and SEIU, locale or local 668, effective July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2027. Article 1, Recognition. Section 1, the union is recognized as the exclusive representative for collective bargaining purposes for employees within the classifications established by certification of the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board. Dated January 4th, 1972. Case number blah blah blah. Section 2, the term employee when used in this agreement is defined as those persons in the positions and classifications covered by the certification referred to in Section 1 of this article and is intended to include energy assistance workers in the Department of Human Services, unless so stated. Article 2, Union Security. The employer shall furnish each new employee's employee with a copy of this agreement together with authorization cards for dues, payroll, deduction, and a packet of information, null material, provided however the union is furnished the employer with sufficient copies of agreement containing the authorization for dues, deduction, as well as sufficient copies of informational material. So this is essentially the same scheme as the so-called uh, purchasing tax or, or uh, well, there's income tax, right? This is the same scheme as income tax, but there's also the uh, sales tax in which employees and vendors will automatically deduct uh, criminally, of course, on behalf of this entity that hides behind them and, of course, uh, strong arms them into doing so through threats and coercion and whatnot. And it's called the union. Union security is the security of the union and not the security for the uh, coerced or, or rather um, uh, obligated members of such a union. This is not a voluntary membership, mind you. The union shall be given the opportunity to access new employees during the agency orientation process. Section 2, the union shall provide a single dedicated email resource account to which the employer will provide a time and copy of the written notice confirming an employee's hire or transfer into a position represented by the bargaining unit. Section 3, it is understood by the parties that a member's status shall not change as a result of a member accepting a promotion to a position within this bargaining unit, transferring to a new work location, or returning from an extended leave. So basically... They control you and your position no matter what. Section 4, request to revoke union membership shall be directed to the union rather than the employer. Any membership resignation request received by the employer should be re redirected to the union. The union shall be solely responsible for processing member resignations. Isn't that interesting? Article 3, dues deduction. Section 1, the employer agrees to deduct the union membership dues, an annual assessment, and an initiation fee from the pay of those employees who individually request in writing that such deductions be made. Signature of the employee on a properly completed union dues deduction authorization card shall constitute the only necessary authorization to begin payroll deductions of said dues. The union shall certify to the employer the rate at which union dues are to be deducted 
And dues at this rate shall be deducted from all compensation paid. Notes that. All compensation paid. The aggregate deduction of all employees shall be remitted together with an itemized statement to the union by the last day of the succeeding month after deductions are made. Section 3, where an employee has been suspended, furloughed, or discharged and subsequently returned to work with full or partial back pay, the employer shall, in the manner outlined in Section 1 above, deduct the union membership dues that are due and owing for the period for which the employee receives back pay. Dues deductions will be resumed for employees upon their return from a leave of absence without pay or recall from furlough. Now, you should also notice that Section 6 states, the union shall indemnify and hold the employer harmless against any and all claims, suits, orders, or judgments brought or issued against the employer as a result of the action taken or not taken by the employer under the provisions of this article. So isn't that interesting? This is a one hand washes the other. Uh, it is not to protect employees. It is instead to protect this institution that is enforcing itself upon others throughout the United States because you'll be able to find represent, uh, representations of this same kind of scheme in pretty much every state across the nation. Article 4, Credit Union. The employer agrees to make payroll deductions available to employees who wish to participate in the state employee's credit union as designated by the union and any one of the credit unions duly chartered under the state or federal statutes and approved by the employer. The employer shall remit the deductions of employees together with an itemized statement to the applicable credit union designated under Section 1 above within 30 days following the end of the calendar month in which deductions were made. Section 4. The union shall indemnify and hold the employer harmless against any and all claims, suits, orders, or judgments brought or issued against the employer as a result of the action taken or not taken by the employer under the provisions of this article. So there is an indemnification section in most of these. The employer agrees to meet and discuss at the request of the union recommendations regarding the transfer of money to the state employee's credit union, as well as the beginning and ending of credit union contributions, section five. Article five, payroll deductions. The event union establishes a health and welfare fund providing benefits to all employees covered by this agreement. The employer agrees to meet and discuss as provided in Act 195 to consider employee payroll deductions for said health and welfare fund. And of course, naturally they would figure out a way to cover all employees, even the ones that are not members of the union or who have uh, voluntarily signed that thing for uh, deductions, they would include everyone under their jurisdiction because that's what they always do. Uh, section two, the employer agrees to deduct from the paycheck of employees covered by this agreement voluntary contributions to the union's political action committee. The employer shall make such deductions only in accordance with the written authorization of respective employees, which shall specify the amount, frequency, and duration of the deduction. The employer shall transmit the monies deducted in accordance with section to the union's political action committee in accordance with the written direction of the union. The union shall reimburse the employer for the employer's actual costs for the expenses incurred in administering this section. Again, the union shall indemnify and hold the commonwealth harmless against all claims, suits, orders, or judgments brought or issued against the employer as a result of action taken or not taken by the employer under the provisions of this article. That is an interesting indemnification clause, considering it lists the Commonwealth. Here, under Section 3 of uh, a different article, union officials or elected delegates shall be granted subject to management's responsibility to maintain efi efficient operations up to six weeks leave without pay each year without loss of seniority credit where such time is necessary to enable them to attend official union conventions or conferences. Employees may use accredited annual leave for this purpose in lieu of leave without pay. The following shall be recognized as official union conferences or conventions. SEIU National Convention, SEIU Public Employee Convention, SEIU Women's Conference, SEIU PA State Council Convention, SEIU Health Care Conventions, AFL-CIO State Convention, CLUW State Convention, CBTU State Convention, AFL-CIO Legislative slash Newspaper, COP, AFL-CIO Regional Conference, AFL-CIO George Meany School, SEIU Regional Conferences, Local 668 Executive Board Meetings, Local 668 Officer Training, Local 668 Legislative Conference, Local 668 Health and Safety Conference, Local 668 Meet and Discuss Training, Local 668 Grievance Training, Local 668 Healthcare Training, Local 668 Convention, Local 668 Leadership Skills Conference, 
and a Philip Root, uh, a Philip Randolph conference. Now, of course, there is always some sort of child trafficking component, which we can find under strangely definitions. A, for the purpose of this article, parent shall be defined as the biological adoptive step or foster parent of the employee or an individual who stood in local parentis to an employee when the employee was a son or daughter. That's an interesting term that they didn't bother to translate called in loco parentis. For the purpose of this article, son or daughter shall be defined as a biological adopted or foster child, stepchild, legal ward, or child of person standing in loco parentis who is under 18 years of age or 18 years of age or older and incapable of self-care because of a mental or physical disability. Section 6. Upon request, an employee shall be entitled to union representation. Notice that wording, shall be entitled. Throughout the grievance procedure, during any meeting in which allegations are to be made with the employee reasonably believes could lead to discipline, or during a meeting held for the purpose of imposing discipline, employee signatures and disciplinary documents shall constitute mere notification and shall not be construed as an admission against interest. It's interesting wording there. No transcripts or tape recordings may be made of a disciplinary meeting. Seems like some similar criminal activities that I recorded or, or documented at the University of Nebraska Kearney, of which those videos can be found on my channels and uh, in the education playlist on YouTube. Section 9, in the event any action is taken by the employer under the provisions of this article, which involves alleged patient abuse and a grievance is filed by an employee, the arbitrator shall not consider the failure of the patient to appear as prejudicial. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please uh, like it, share it, subscribe to my channels. There are free books available at the links. And if you have a desire, you may support my work at any of the options available, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, etc. Thank you.